Hello, and welcome to the first webinar of the 2017 in the MJV NCTC Monarch Conservation Webinar Series. My name is Tracy McLeaf. I'm a biologist with the Fish and Wildlife Service at the National Conservation Training Center, and we're glad you could join us today. And now I'd like to introduce you to Cora Lund Preston, the Communications Specialist at Monarch Joint Venture. She's here today to introduce today's presenters. Cora? Thanks, Tracy, and hi, everyone. Um, thanks again for joining us. As Tracy mentioned, my name is Cora Lund Preston from the Monarch Joint Venture. I'm also joined by Wendy and Shelby from the MJV. Um, today, we're excited to have researchers who work with both the eastern and western monarch populations here to share their experience and thoughts on monarch overwintering biology and conservation. Emma Pelton is a conservation biologist at the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation, whose work focuses on the conservation of monarch butterflies and their migration in western North America. Dr. Pablo Jaramillo Lopez is an associate professor at the National Autonomous University of Mexico in Morelia and conducts research on ways to improve degraded soils and recover deforested areas using organic and semi-organic soil amendments in the Monarch Butterfly Biosphere Reserve in Mexico. Throughout the presentations, we encourage you to enter your questions into the chat box. Wendy, Shelby, and I will be monitoring the chat box for questions, and we'll have a question and answer period at the end of the webinar where we will address as many questions as we are able to get to. So now I'll turn it over to Emma to get us started. Hi, Cora. Thank you for the introduction, and thanks, everyone, for joining. I'll be presenting on monarch overwintering biology and migration and conservation in the western U.S. And just to begin, as Cora mentioned, I work for the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. We are a nonprofit working to protect invertebrates and their habitats. Our work consists of conservation planning, applied research, citizen science, education, habitat restoration, and policy and advocacy. And we've worked extensively on monarchs for decades and have multiple full-time staff working on monarch conservation. So to begin, I'm going to present a little bit about what we know and what we don't know about monarch migration in North America. Monarchs are unique in their phenomenal migration to both the OML fir forest in Mexico and to the California coast. Each spring, monarchs, which overwinter in Mexico, fly north, indicated by the yellow arrows, through the southern United States, passing through states like Texas in search of milkweed to lay eggs. Here, monarchs lay eggs, which become the first new generation of the year. And when these monarchs grow up, they continue to fly further north to populate the Midwest, the Northeast, the Great Plains, and even into southern Canada the northern extent of milkweed growth. And here is where the second, third, and fourth generation of monarchs are produced. In the fall, mon the migratory generation of monarchs begin their journey south again on their way back to Mexico, indicated by the red arrows. And in comparison in the west coast, you'll notice a red arrow leaving a red area on the California coast where monarchs overwinter all the way from Mendocino County, north of San Francisco, down into Baja, Mexico. So in the spring, monarchs from these overwintering sites in California disperse into the interior of California, up into the Pacific Northwest and the Southwest, where they have spring breeding. And later in the summer, they reach into the interior west, such as Idaho, and have multiple generations. And then again in the fall, the monarchs return to those overwintering sites along the California coast. However, you'll notice some dotted arrows in the southwest, which we'll talk a little bit more about. But we do know that monarchs from the southwest can also migrate to central Mexico as well as the California coast. So this interchange between the eastern and western monarchs in Mexico was not well known or understood until quite recently. And there are still many questions left to answer about monarch migration, such as if monarchs in Mexico fly back to the west in the spring and the extent of breeding between what we call the eastern and the western monarchs, especially in the interior parts of the United States, such as Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, and the southwest. So how do we try and answer these questions we still have about monarch migration? I'm going to introduce two methods that scientists and citizen scientists are using to get at answers of where monarchs come from and where they migrate to.
The tagging is a method that has been used since the 1960s for monarchs and acts as a, in a similar way that bird banding does. It tells you where an animal has started and how it ended up in another place. So as this map shows, the green lines represent where monarchs came from and how they ended up on the California coast. So you'll see a lot of arrows from Washington and Oregon that end up on the California coast. But you'll also see in the southwest that monarchs in Arizona are either going to California or to central Mexico. So collectively, um, what great work from Southwest Monarch Study and other monarch tagging programs throughout the U.S. have shown us that monarchs from the Southwest have been recovered in both Mexico and California, meaning that the extent of mixing of these populations is unknown, but is at least occurring in the overwintering stage in Mexico. You'll see from the map that we have very few tagging recoveries from the interior west and the inner mountain west. So there are many questions that remain about those areas. Another newer method of looking at where monarchs are from and where they migrate to is by using isotopic signatures in the bodies of overwintering monarchs. Depending on where monarchs grow up, the milkweed they ingest as caterpillars give their bodies a unique isotopic signature that acts as a marker of where in North America they came from. We understand how to read these markers well for the entire continent using the hydrogen isotope. So we only understand how to read carbon isotopes from the eastern United States. This technique was first used for monarchs in the late 1990s, which indicated that most overwintering monarchs in Mexico came from the Midwest. However, we know a lot has changed about agricultural practices and the loss of breeding habitat in the Midwest due to the use of genetically modified crops and associated increased use of herbicides, as well as the loss of other habitats such as in CRP across the United States since the 90s. So a new study released just two weeks ago by Tyler Flockhart et al. redid that 1998 study and expanded it to assess the natal origins of over 1,000 monarchs collected over the past 40 years. Some of the study's major findings included that there was a lot of variation from year to year and where monarchs came from, which is partially explained by differences in weather. And as you can see from this map, the Midwest is colored a dark green, and the bar chart above shows you the proportion of overwintering monarchs that were coming from the Midwest and how that varied from year to year. But on average, this area produced 38% of the monarchs that made it to Mexico, which is a lot of monarchs. But the Midwest on this map is also a very large land area. So one implication of the study is that while the Midwest is still important as a natal area for monarchs, you'll see that other areas are also important. You can see from the percentages given on the map that monarchs are coming from Canada, from the Northeast, and from the South. And it's important to note that the study is only looking at the overwintering generation of monarchs. The first and second generations produced in the South in the spring are important to the overall population but wouldn't make it all the way back to Mexico. It's also interesting that there was no clear change in the proportion of monarchs coming from a certain region over time. Uh, we might expect to see a trend as certain areas lost or gained habitat, uh, but because these proportions seem somewhat constant, the other explanations that have been posited is that the loss of natal habitat is occurring throughout the monarch's range and not only in one area might explain why we haven't seen a change in proportion over time, but why the overall numbers of monarchs has decreased. The findings also reinforce that an all-hands-on-deck approach to conservation and restoring habitat is really important. Clearly, all areas of the eastern United States are uh, producing monarchs, which make it to Mexico. So it's important to think about where we restore habitat, such as nectar and milkweed, as well as reducing stressors, such as pesticides on monarchs. However, one limitation of this study, which is important to note, is that because the carbon ice escape is not well understood in the West, the study's authors did not include the possibility that monarchs were originating from the West. You can see this cutoff in their area uh, included on the map. However, as I just showed you from our tagging evidence, we know that monarchs are coming from the Southwest. They may be coming from other parts of the West. So these conclusions of natal origins are important, but also must be caveated by the fact that we're not getting the complete picture of natal origins in Mexico. 
A similar isotopic study has been completed at California overwintering sites by using hydrogen isotopes. Louis Yang and authors at UC Davis assessed the natal origins of monarchs at four California overwintering sites and found monarchs originate from all regions of the West, which are indicated by the different colors in the bar graphs or in the um, pie charts. And particularly important is the interior West, which is colored with a, a light tan color, which is Idaho, Eastern Washington, Oregon, and Montana. And this is somewhat surprising as Many of us used to think that these areas were probably too cold to be very productive for monarchs. So this study came to a similar conclusion as the Flockhart study, which is that monarchs appear to be coming from all regions and making it to overwintering grounds. However, while both studies offer valuable insight into natal origins of monarchs, neither study is fully addressing the interchange of monarchs across the continent, and thus we don't have a full picture of natal origins in either California or Mexico. Carbon or another ice escape would have to be developed to increase geographic precision, and this is something researchers are actively working towards and will be important in helping us better understand where monarchs come from and how best to conserve the species. Other questions that we still need to answer include, do monarchs overwintering in Mexico migrate back to the west in the spring? We know from tagging that they go one direction, we would have to be tagging in Mexico to see if they come back into the southwest in the spring. But as you can imagine, it's much harder to look for a tagged monarch dispersed out on the landscape than it is when they're gathered together at an overwintering site. We also can't rely on natal origin studies to ask how important different regions are for the first and second generations of monarchs. Those aren't the monarchs that make it to overwintering sites, but they're still vitally important to ramp up population numbers each spring. So now that we've covered an overview of what we know about migration, I'm going to zoom in on what we know about monarchs who migrate to overwintering sites in coastal California before Pablo talks a little bit more about overwintering sites in Mexico. So this map shows where we know monarchs cluster along the California coast. We have over 400 uh, recorded sites. Usually they're within just a few miles from the Pacific Ocean or in the San Francisco Bay. They stretch from Mendocino County in California all the way into Baja, Mexico. And historically, monarchs clustered at these sites at the tens of thousands or even over 100,000 monarchs at a single site. So as populations have decreased, today most of these sites only host monarchs in the hundreds or thousands, with just a handful of sites regularly hosting more than 10,000 monarchs. A few small overwintering clusters, usually just in single digits to dozens, have been reported in other areas of the West, such as interior parts of California near the Sierra Nevada mountains. You'll see some interior green dots on that map, as well as near Lake Mead, near Las Vegas in Nevada, and in areas of Arizona. So while the vast majority of monarchs migrate to either Mexico or to the California coast, some of these smaller pockets of monarchs are forming in desert areas, which is an interesting phenomenon that we won't go into much more here. So once monarchs reach the overwintering site in California, this is typically occurring in September and October, which is a little bit earlier than they usually show up in Mexico. And that could be due to the fact that they might have a shorter area to travel, a shorter distance to migrate. They're overwintering usually until February or March. We're just hearing our first reports now in late January of monarchs starting to become more active. So in the next few weeks, some of those sites will start to disperse. While monarchs are at the overwintering sites, they're largely in reproductive diapause. When temperatures are greater than 55 degrees, they might be short, flying short distances to find nectar, keep their energy reserves up, and sip dew and stretch their wings. Uh, one exception is far southern California. A similar phenomenon is occurring in the Gulf Coast near Texas, where year-round breeding on tropical milkweed has become quite common. And this is concerning because work from Project Monarch Health has shown that monarchs that overwinter and breed on tropical milkweed are showing nine times the parasite OE rate. So with that in mind, as well as the fact that milkweed historically did not occur close to many overwintering sites in California, the Xerces Society recommends 
that instead of planting milkweed, you should plant fall, winter, and spring blooming nectar plants to help monarchs as they're usually out searching for nectar throughout the season. What are monarchs really looking for when they pick an overwintering site? They're finding a place that acts as a thermal blanket and a rain umbrella. Overwintering monarchs require protection from winds and storms, and they require Goldilocks conditions. They want cool weather, so they don't use all of their energy reserves if they were quite warm. They also don't want it to be freezing, where they could suffer mortality. They also need sufficient humidity to keep their water reserves up and exposure to dappled sunlight. This picture I took in downtown Berkeley um, just last winter shows monarchs in a perfect example of the dappled sunlight that they like best. They also rely on nearby water sources, which could be a stream or could be a field that collects dew and winter blooming nectar plants. Most California overwintering sites are dominated by a non-native group of trees, the eucalyptus genus came from Australia. Europeans brought them in in the 1850s, and they've come to really dominate the California coast. But research by Griffiths and Villablanca indicates that monarchs do not prefer eucalyptus trees over native tree species. But because eucalyptus are so dominant and provide the right microclimate conditions, monarchs are quite adaptable and readily use eucalyptus. However, monarchs also cluster on native species, including native Monterey cypress and Monterey pine. So how do you count butterflies that are spread along the Pacific coast? I'd like to take a moment to get an uh, overview of the brief history of how we've counted butterflies in California over the years. Uh, monarchs were first documented overwintering in California 200 years ago by a Russian expedition that stopped in the San Francisco Bay and noted the first specimen known to Western science. And if you fast forward to the 80s and 90s, there was growing interest in monarch biology and conservation along the coast. And some surveys that were done statewide as well as at a county level really documented these sites and put them on the map so we had a better idea of where these locations were that monarchs were returning to year after year. But as the 90s went on, monarch biologists started to notice that numbers seemed to be going down and realized that to better understand if there were population trends, they would have to launch more systematic surveying of the site. And so three biologists, including Mia Monroe, started the Western Monarch Thanksgiving Count, which has continued today. We just celebrated our 20th anniversary, and we're continuing on, co-coordinated by the Xerces Society and by one of the founders, Mia Monroe. We also rely heavily on really knowledgeable local and regional coordinators. So what is the Western Monarch Thanksgiving Count? At its core, it's counting or estimating the number of monarchs at overwintering sites. We have a three-week period centered around the Thanksgiving holiday each year. We ask people to go out and visit sites, and together this gives us a snapshot, the size of the population along the coast. Besides counting the number of monarchs, we also ask people to keep an eye out for tags and note the tree species that the monarchs are clustering on. And over the years, we've added additional uh, citizen science participation options. So you can now do a habitat assessment to give us more information about the boundary of the site, and the site conditions, and the resources that are there for monarchs. And this past year, we launched a New Year's count, which will give us a second snapshot of the size of the overwintering population. And that's the first two weeks of January, starting around New Year's Eve. We had over 20 sites counted, and we hope to grow this in the coming years. So every year, once we get all of our data in from our volunteers, we compile it, and the green bar represents the total number of monarchs our volunteers counted. And the blue triangles represent the number of sites they monitored. As I said earlier, we have over 400 sites along the California coast, and we cannot get to all of them every year. So we visit different sites each year. But collectively, we get a total number of monarchs, and then we compare that to the amount of effort that we put in to count those monarchs. So looking at this graph does not give you a very accurate representation of the population trends, but it is important to note that as monarch numbers in the past few years appear stable, the total number of monarchs we counted is hovering around 200,000 to 250,000 monarchs. 
the amount of effort we're putting into counting that number of monarchs is continuing to increase, which doesn't bode well in terms of a trend. And this is a preliminary graph. We are still waiting for a few more counts, but I wanted to show that we've had a great uptick in effort this past season. So beyond this graph, we have a lot more information that our volunteers and other biologists are collecting at these overwintering sites. And this past year, the Xerces Society compiled a lot of that information into a report, which we call our State of the Monarch Butterfly Overwintering Sites Report is available for PDF download on our website. By looking at the data in more detail, we could document that there has been nearly a 74% decline in monarchs since the late 1990s, which is quite similar to the decline seen at the overwintering sites in Mexico. We also got a better picture of the threats that many of these groves are facing, and we prioritized the top 50 sites most important for conservation action. Within the report, we have this top 50 sites. And to think about how to prioritize sites, there's a lot of different criteria you might want to put into choosing which sites need the most attention. And the way we chose to approach this was by picking sites that had experienced the steepest declines in numbers over the last 20 years, and yet still had the greatest proportion of the remaining population. So some of our top sites include Pismo Beach, some private sites, which are not legally protected, Elwood, Maine, in the city of Goleta, some golf courses, Pacific Grove Sanctuary, which a lot of people know well, as well as Lighthouse Field State Beach. So historically, a lot of overwintering sites faced the main conservation issue of development. We know that monarchs are not the only creatures that really enjoy the California coast, and in the 80s and 90s, over 50 overwintering sites were lost completely, mostly to commercial and housing developments. However, this trend continues, and we have sites continuing to be lost each year. This photo was taken by Liam O'Brien, one of our count coordinators in San Francisco. And he found this site last year had a fair number of monarchs, and this past year had almost no monarchs. You can see from the photo that these eucalyptus trees have been heavily trimmed. Beside this direct loss of current sites, we also know that encroaching development can alter the microhabitat conditions that monarchs rely on, can decrease their protection from winds and storms. And also, because monarchs rely on mature trees, it can take decades for forests to reach their full potential to host monarchs. So as development continues, we're losing potential suitable habitat that would have been good for monarchs 10 or 20 years down the line. Besides development, many of the groves are senescing, and the ongoing drought in California has led to tree loss, as well as a decline in the amount of nectar the trees are producing. And there are other effects of climate change, um, which was discussed a little bit in a previous webinar. And tree pests and diseases are also an issue. There are many non-native eucalyptus insect pests that affect the trees and further stress them. And for our native Monterey pines, they're suffering from pitch canker. So together, these stressors mean that we need to be actively managing these sites to maintain and restore growth conditions. And to that end, there will be guidance coming out from the Xerces Society, as well as co-authored by a grove restoration practitioner, Stu Weiss, this coming spring. An example of a site that we're working with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to develop a site management plan, along with Groundswell, another nonprofit, is Lighthouse Field State Beach in downtown Santa Cruz. This is a somewhat classic site. You'll see the overstory canopy of eucalyptus that are providing wind protection to the native Monterey cypress trees that the monarchs typically roost on. In the past year, there's been some storms and some cutting of trees on the edge of the grove, which has now opened up a wind tunnel. When storm events come through, monarchs can be blown off these cypress trees onto the avenue behind them where they're really susceptible to be run over by cars and for predators. So we're thinking about how we can better fill this gap to protect the monarchs that are there so that the site can continue in the decades to come to host the large number of monarchs it can host. So finally, if you want to get involved, the Western Monarch Thanksgiving Count, we're always looking for more volunteers who want to get trained and mentored. Um, you can visit us on Facebook or on our website. 
and we have a new citizen science project being launched called the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper that serves as a platform for people to share observations of monarchs and milkweeds across the West. And that will be launched, and both projects will be available through the Monarch SOS app, which is available free through iTunes. And besides Xerces projects, there's other great citizen science projects at Overwintering Sites, including Monarch Alert at Cal Poly that works to tag monarchs and look at movement between overwintering sites throughout the season. And if you're interested to help answer these questions I presented about migration, you can get involved in tagging that's not occurring at overwintering sites. That includes Southwest Monarch Study and Monarch Butterflies of the Pacific Northwest. And finally, I'd just like to make a plug that we need more citizen scientists in the West participating in other national citizen science projects that have led to such gains in our understanding of monarch distribution and disease. The Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, I have a screenshot of their website of all their participants. See that the West is pretty poorly represented. And Project Monarch Health is the great group that's looking at OE and its spread and prevalence. So you can check out these projects. We link to them on our website. You can also check out xerces.org slash monarchs for our native nectar and milkweed guides if you want to attract monarchs uh, to your backyard. So with that, I would just like to thank all the citizen scientists and coordinators that make the Western Monarch Thanksgiving Count possible and all of our Xerces supporters. And I'll turn it back to you, Cora. Thank you, Emma. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning, if you have questions for Emma, please enter them in the chat box and we'll save them for our Q&A with both presenters at the end of the webinar. So now we'll hear from Pablo to discuss the eastern population of overwintering monarchs in Mexico. Pablo, go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Cora. And uh, I would like to thank you for having me here and for inviting me to be part of this wonderful series. So we're gonna be traveling south all the way to Mexico, on these few mountain tops in the states of Michoacan and the state of Mexico. This is where the Monarch Butterfly Reserve is located. And it's a very different ecosystem from the ones in California and it has other very interesting perspectives and threats that also monarchs have to face. So this is what we're looking at every time that we get a beautiful opportunity to go to see these wonderful organisms make it back year after year to the same patches of forest that their great-grandparents were at. This is absolutely mind-blowing and still has such a magical component associated with it. And Every time that I get a chance to see them and visit the site, I see that they're so, so resilient and so resistant to all the threats that human beings are posing to them. The densities of the monarch colonies have shifted and have changed, and this is a result of various, various things that happen to those forests. The structure of the forest in Mexico is a, is a very interesting and different one from the ones in California. It's a, it's a site dominated by fir. It's a species of fir. It's a Oya male in Mexico. It's the name, that's the Spanish name for it. It's Abies religiosa. And it's a very interesting species because it does not like to be transplanted. What we have seen is that it survives better if it if it germinates from the seeds in the area, which means that if we're focusing on natural regeneration, we might be more successful at recovering and allowing those forests to recover instead of planting trees. We're gonna be focusing on these tiny, tiny sections of tree, of, of patches of forest, very different from the ones in California, which spread out along the coast the, the reserve in Mexico is the area that is, in, that is reserved is 56,000 hectares. And of those, 13,000 hectares are the core zone, and this is where the monarchs form their colonies. These forests, as you can be aware of this, are so important for the survival of the, of the monarchs. 
During the months of November, December, January, February, and March, the whole population, the whole eastern population, is now in these forests. So you can see the importance of conserving and protecting these forests. And of course, we, we are left wondering what happens for the rest of the year. You see this image. There's a log right beside the colony in the colony area. Unfortunately, logging is still something important. And because this is a reserve, manage, forest management practices are not allowed inside the core zone. They are allowed in the buffer zone, but this poses an, an important issue. There should be forest monitoring all the time, but when there's no tourism and when the butterflies are not here, those forests are abandoned. They're left alone. So they're more prone for Ill illegal logging activities. Every time that I've been able to go there, there's something like this happening in various parts of the reserve. In 2015, there was a very serious illegal logging activity in the Sierra Cinque colony in, uh, in Michoacán. We raised the flag and we said that something was really serious going on and that there was logging going on and we were able to, to, to document this. And this is a very important area for the monarchs, especially for the Sierra Cinque colony. This colony, towards the end of March, will migrate close to these areas and will probably mate. This is a very important area because it's, it has a lot of water. But now that it has been heavily logged, we're not sure how it's going to be recovering. So we, as a group with other scientists from Mexico, decided that there should be a plan to recover it. What I want to point out to you from this slide is I want you to look at the red perimeter that's shown in the center of that image. That shows the area that was heavily logged. And if you see the purple lines as a triangle, it shows the state-owned area. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but most of the areas in the region, in the Monarch Reserve, are owned by either indigenous communities or ejidos. These are local populations of humans that live in the area, and of course, they live there all the time, not only when the butterflies are here. So what I, what I wanna point out to you in this slide is that you see those triangles those triangles are where the monarchs have formed colonies dating back to 1975, 1976, sorry. So if you look at the perimeter of where the, of the, where the trees were cut, all of the trees were cut inside the state-owned land, which means that forest protection was somewhat being happening on the adjacent tejidos. You don't see many trees that were cut in either Cerro, Cerro Prieto to the right or Jesus de Nazareno to the left. And this means that forest protection by locals might be a little bit more powerful than what's happening on a, on a larger scale. This is a sign of that. So maybe empowering local people to have um, more of a monitoring scheme so they can become protectors of the forest might work better. To make matters worse, we had a really severe storm in March 2016, and everybody was really worried about it because the butterflies were still here. That storm was really, really, it was a freak storm, and it was really, really bad for the whole ecosystem, not only for the butterflies, but also for the ecosystem. It brought in very strong winds that damaged the forest very, very much. So. We've been trying to determine how this, um, this event has actually altered the ecosystem for the butterflies. So we're actually carrying out a study to determine how natural regeneration has affected, was, has been affected by the, by the extraction of the wood. After the storm happened, right around April, Local ejidatarios were able to get a permit to extract the wood that fell because of the storm, all of these logs and all of these trees that fell because of the storm. 
And unfortunately, it was carried out with very little supervision. And we continue to see all of the trees taken out of the reserve. And this, this picture on, the, on your left was taken 29th of April, 2016. So we're not sure how many of those trees were a result of the salvage logging, or how many of those trees were a result of illegal logging. Because these permits were given, we don't know where the origin of these trees, what the origin of these trees is, is. And also, we continue to see it throughout the whole summer. The permit was granted from April until the 31st of October. This is very serious. And there's actually not a lot of information about this out there. So we're trying to, to, to find ways to, to estimate how the, the forest was uh, degraded and altered because of these salvage logging activities. I recently visited the Sierra Cinqua colony and this is how the forest looks in certain patches of it. Because of the extraction of the wood, the damage to the forest and degradation of that ecosystem has been really severe. And just to, to, to give you an idea, the picture on the, on the right, taken on 3 January 2017, is an area where the monarchs have formed colonies for many, many years. They haven't formed colonies this year because the forest doesn't even look close or resemble the microclimatic conditions of what it used to be. This is very serious because on top of this, we see that monarch activity is very, very high. And this is unique because I think that, be, that, that the removal of these trees that has been um, happening for many, many months has changed the ecosystem and that's why we see the butterflies so active. The monarchs are extremely active. We have seen them, uh, we have seen some of them mating and they're forming colonies in other places that are not the regular places where they form the colonies, which is because, which resulted in this modification of the ecosystem. So we're continuing to see alter, altered activity in the monarchs. And I think it's because of the, of the change in the ecosystem due to all these um, events, the storm and the salvage logging. What I want to point out is that these forests, you, can, you, can, you think about this in a very specific way, these forests are extremely important. So there should be a, a management plan that everybody follows. There's NGOs, there's government agencies, and everybody should be working together. All of us should know exactly what we're aiming for. And this is something that we really have to work on on this side because it seems that we're working in, as individuals. We're working independently. And I think we should be working together as a team. The forests should be more valuable. Local people should be benefiting from protecting the forests. And there should be a well-paid job if the forest is worth more standing up, that means that local people are going to try to protect it even more. This is crucial because now they're receiving payments for environmental services, but they're not working towards something. They're receiving the money for, quote unquote, leaving the forest as is. So this is very important. There should be something generated by local people, either reports, pictures, they should be measuring data on tree, on tree health, tree density, natural regeneration uh, processes, and everything that happens together. And that should be a well-paid job. And it should, there should be transparency and accountability for all these activities. So everybody knows that there is something being generated in those forests. And local people know that they have a job to do, which they're getting paid for really well. So we end up with, the, with figures that are generated by, by, by monitors, and they tell us how the population is looking every year. And this is based on the surface of the forest the butterflies are covering. In other words, it's looking at the area inside the forest 
where the monarchs are roosting. If you see the picture on your left, and you see that the trees are less dense, that also affects how the colonies are forming inside the forest. So on top of measuring the area where the monarchs form their colonies, there should be a way to determine the density of these colonies. Because it's not the same to have one hectare with 12 butterflies as to have one hectare with 20 million butterflies. This is crucial too. So on top of measuring that, there should be an effort to determine the density of those colonies. You can see this image. This is a bark of a tree taken on one day and then the same bark taken on another day. The density differs not only between days, but also in one day, which means that the colonies, the, the size of the, of the colonies and the density should be measured right around the same time so the data are comparable. This is very important for statistical purposes, but also to see if the colonies are actually declining or improving. This is very, very critical. Moving along to something else that is also quite disturbing is that if the forests are degraded, and this is especially true in the buffer zone of the reserve, we as humans begin to see a loss of goods and services that we get from the ecosystem. A healthy forest provides amazing ecosystem services for humans, not to mention for other organisms that live inside the reserve. If you see this image, you're gonna see in the forefront the soil that's being, that's, that has been degraded heavily, and that's because the, the trees have been removed. If you look at the background, you see all these new avocado plantations, and avocados are expanding, especially in the buffer zone. But it also, but it means that there is a demand for those avocados. North Americans have found their next best thing, their newfound love, and they love to eat avocados. And it's a great, great product. It's also a great crop for locals. These avocados can serve and can be the new trend in production. Let me explain what I mean about this idea. I'm sure you've all heard about bird-friendly coffee, fair trade, all these new certificates that products that come from far away might receive. I think that avocados can become our best, our best ally for protecting the forests. If we can come some, somehow come up with a scheme to protect the forest, because the avocados that are being produced in the area generate extra income, and that extra income goes to protecting the forest as it is, that might make those avocados more attractive. But we have to work together with the consumers in the United States and Canada. So they, they look for, for such an avocado that is responsible with the ecosystem, that is forest friendly. So. If we find and develop this scheme, I think avocados can be our next best ally for protecting the forest. There's a wonderful example of, of, this, of this idea, and it's the community, is the local ejido of Carpinteros. Carpinteros is close to Sitacuaro. They have amazing avocado plantations at the bottom of the mountain, and they have a beautiful lush forest that provides them with water for, for the whole year and for their avocado plantations. And interestingly, they have a monarch butterfly colony at the, at the top of their mountain. So you can see this, this model right in action and it actually works. So those avocados can be worth more because the forest is protected because of the avocados being, in, being together with the forest. Something else that is also very important is to mention that there is a mine that has been there for a long time, and this mine is in, a, in the town of Angeo. There's a push to reopen this mine, 
And this is also important to mention because the mine, it's not a new mine. It's a mine that was there before the reserve was created. The mine was closed in 1985 and the reserve was created in 1986. And it was expanded to what it currently holds now in the year 2000. So we need to develop a very close relationships, relationship with this mine and maybe get them to help protect the forest. So how to, how to get around them just doing things because of economic interest? We should, tr we should try to work with them and tell them that there is also an ecological interest, that, this whole, that the whole world has their, their eyes looking at these forests. And of course, we have to be very open and very willing to collaborate and make suggestions on how to protect the forest. So this goes hand in hand with the initial idea of permanent jobs for people that go around collecting data on forest health, status of the natural regeneration, and yes, reforestation in areas where they should be reforesting. The buffer zone is ideal for reforestation. And we showed this in a, in a, in a research study that we published in 2015, where we looked at applying a soil organic amendment in the soil to improve the reforestation success. But we sort of transferred the re responsibility to local people, and this worked really well. They became the owners of their experiment, and now they know how to measure the, how the tree grows, and they also know how to estimate survival rates. So those reports should be generated by local people, and they should be put in the website for the mine, they should be put in the website for the government agencies, and everybody should be working together with a similar common goal. After telling you all these bad news and good news at the same time, we always wonder how, how can we help? What can we do? And of course, there's a lot of things that all of us can do. We can all be working together, as I have mentioned before, and it's not, it's not the time to be pointing fingers at each other. We should be working together. We have to realize that our food system, the way that we produce our food, is very critical for the monarch's survival. But it also means that if we eat healthy food, we're going to be protecting other pollinators as well. If we stop using or reduce the use of so many harsh chemicals in our agricultural system, that means that we're going to have access to cleaner and healthier food. But it also means that we're going to be protecting and promoting the life of these other organisms that are living beside our agricultural production systems. This is very important for corn, as it's an ever-growing pr product. And you might think that Every time you go to the supermarket, everything you buy has an impact on the environment. So the cleaner the food, the less of an impact it might have. Of course, this is only thinking at the agricultural process, not necessarily talking about the transporting costs. But if we think about our food, that might also be the key to the survival of these organisms. As consumers, we have to demand that the food that we eat comes from a cleaner source every time. There should be information associated with the products that we consume and we buy from the store that tells us what kind of food we're eating. Going hand in hand, the US and Canada, with all of their citizen scientists and all of their monitors and all the people that are really involved in monarch protection, prairie land, and areas that are not agricultural, where milkweed plants grow, should be protected at all costs. This also means that other areas that can be left alone should be left alone. Milkweed plants will grow and they will come back. And if we were to plant milkweed plants, we should be looking at local species. We shouldn't bring species from other places. 
This means that we're protecting the areas and we're promoting the growth of the local species of milkweed, which if you think about it, it's the only re it's the reason why monarchs migrate because they continue to look for these various species of milkweed. Thinking about the, the, the logging and thinking about where, where the wood comes from, everybody in Mexico, the States and Canada has to know where their wood is coming from. We're not going to be promoting illegal logging if we buy wood from known sources. So that would probably force the people inside the reserve, especially in the buffer zone, to start aiming for these certificates for the wood production. Then we reduce illegal logging as well. With this, I would like to leave uh, you with the question of how are humans changing the ecosystem so much, which alter populations of other organisms? Can we reverse the trend? Can we do something about it? We definitely can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pablo, and thank you to you, Emma, as well, for sharing your perspectives with us today. Um, and thanks again to everyone who's listening. We're so glad you're here. Um, next, we're going to take uh, the next few minutes to talk with Pablo and Emma and ask them some questions that have come up from the audience during the presentations. Uh, if you have more questions, be sure to enter those into the chat box. But first, I have a couple housekeeping announcements. We did record today's webinar, so if you want to share it or come back and watch it again, it will be available online on the MJV and NCTC websites soon. We will follow up after today's webinar with a short survey for you to complete, sharing any feedback you have. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And now as we get into the questions, if we go over the allotted time, feel free to step out whenever you need to. Um, we may not get to all of the questions that were asked throughout the webinar today, but we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so let's get started with a um, question for Emma. So Emma, you mentioned, uh, you talked about the isotopic studies um, at the beginning of your talk, and we had a question about um, where are the butterflies um, that were used for these isotopic analyses collected from? Sure. So I would say that for Mexico, they were collected at a subset of the different colonies. Um, and I'm not sure which different studies collected different monarchs um, at different times. And for California, uh, you can see on the map uh, the different sites that they were collected from. But Pismo Beach was one of the sites. And then there were three other sites along the California coast. And the researchers made sure that those sites were spread out so that they weren't just collecting monarchs from the southern part the overwintering range or the northern part of the overwintering range. Great. Thank you. Um, and then we'll go for a question for both of you. Um, and Emma, you can answer this first. And then um, Pablo, if there are differences that you want to share for the Mexican overwintering population, um, we can then pass it on to you. But um, a good question that we had asked was, um, how does monarch activity and movement at the overwintering sites change with the weather? And I'll let you start, Emma. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's still a lot we don't know, but we know monarchs do move in response to storms. Um, just in December, I was down at Pacific Grove with a group of other researchers, and we were at Pacific Grove looking at the monarchs and there were some strong winds and as we were watching the monarchs react as to their branches being tossed to and fro, some of the monarchs started to leave the clusters and fly into a different part of the grove and reform a new cluster. So we saw it happening in real time that monarchs wow. were responding, which was fantastic to see. And from great work by Monarch Alert that's done some tagging over the years at overwintering sites, we know that some sites there's movement from one grove to a different grove throughout the season. Mm -hmm. An example of this is at Lighthouse Field, State Beach, and Natural Bridges State Park. They're two state parks quite close to each other in Santa Cruz. 
And what we often see there is that monarchs like natural bridges early in the season, and as the weather gets colder and the storms come through, they tend to move to lighthouse field. So we know there's some movement between sites, um, but the extent of that and how far monarchs travel uh, is still a big question. Wow, thanks, Emma. Um, Pablo, do you have anything to add to that question of how activity and movement changes with the weather? Sure, very quickly. Um, monarchs look for very stable microclimatic conditions inside the forest. And as Emma has explained, the forest acts like a blanket. So the weather is not too warm or too cold, but this is very dependent on the density of the forest. We have seen that the forest is being altered. So the activity of the, of the monarchs is based on daily temperature changes. When it's really warm, they're very active and they start flying all over the place. And what we, we see is that they go looking for water sources. We do see them nectaring, but it's mostly looking for water. And this, is, this happens during the day when the temperature is a little bit higher. And this means that the colony itself is also moving. So if you imagine in your head something expanding and, and, and contracting at the same time, and this is dependent on the temperature of one single day. So if the trees are less dense, that means that the wind will go in through a little bit more freely which means that the temperature might be a little bit more extreme. And this is why the conservation and the protection of those forests is also very, very important because the temperature can become extreme very, very quickly. When you visit those sites, you feel it. When you're in the shade, it's cold. And when you're exposed to the sun, it's really warm. So that means that the, the monarchs are extremely dependent on the temperature. Wow, there's a lot, uh, a lot to learn. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, following up on that, Pablo, um, we had another question for you about, um, can you talk about some of the efforts to um, reforest sites where damage and logging has occurred? I'm going to be focusing on one particular part that we're working on right now. I mentioned this illegal logging that took place in Sierra Cinqua, and those are 10 hectares that were affected by illegal logging. So based on a map, a zoning map that was developed by a researcher at the Research Institute for Geography, um, areas that, ha that have no vegetation were reforested. And this happened in June, 2016, right when trees should be planted because it's the rainy season. And this is very important because if you develop a reforestation plan, it has to happen at the right time of the year. Otherwise, the trees that are planted will never see the rain, which means that they will be exposed to drought and they'll probably die. So looking at, at the whole reserve as a whole and taking into account that each particular area is different, the buffer zone which is lower in elevation, is prone for reforestation. But the core zone, where the monarchs form the colony, is prone for natural regeneration. And these are very different schemes. One, you, you, you sort of protect the forest as is and maybe use barbed wire, not to allow cows to enter or people to enter, so the, the, the regenerating saplings come up on their own. And when they're ready, you can take the fence somewhere else and then the cows can move in freely because, let's face it, humans have their cows and cows roam freely throughout the reserve. And in the buffer zone, areas that are identified as ideal for planting trees should be planted trees. And we should develop the same um, concept with the avocados. So if we think about it as an avocado plantation is expanding, there's another area that should be recovering for reforestation. And inside the core zone, all these areas that are coming back on their own should also be part of a, of a yearly map that's generated. And uh, Dr. Isabel Ramirez at, uh, at uh, the Research Institute for Research Center for uh, Environmental Geography is an expert in all these zoning uh, areas. So again, we should be working together with a common goal for all of us.
not thinking that we're going to be saving some section or other section. And all these activities should be um, should be focused as a group. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so we'll switch back to a question for Emma. Um, Emma, could you talk a bit more about the implications of the higher OE prevalence in areas of Southern California where monarchs are breeding during the winter? Sure. Yeah, this question um, has some nuance. So I went over it quite quickly in this webinar, but we know that tropical milkweed in mild climate areas, so in Florida, the Gulf State area right on the coast in Texas, as well as in Southern California, tropical milkweed, which is non-native, doesn't die back uh, because the winters aren't harsh enough. And so those leaves continue to grow and persist through the winter. And this is different than native milkweeds that usually senesce. And so OE is a parasite that collects and develops and builds up on the leaves of these plants. And if you have a plant naturally dying back, it kind of resets the OE. So the next mm -hmm. spring, you don't have very much OE. But in warm areas where monarchs can stay active and there continues to be um, milkweed available in the form of tropical milkweed, they might be reinfesting the population. So these populations in these areas continue to have really high OE levels. And this is concerning because this could be stressing these are already really stressed populations. And we know from work from Dara Satterfield and Sonia Altazir's lab that monarchs that have high OE levels are less successful mi uh, migrators. And so this can kind of cause a double whammy where they're infected and they're less able to migrate and they stay in the area and it continues to build up. So it's a concern in Southern California. Um, it's been a concern in Florida for a long time. So we encourage people to plant native milkweeds and to remove tropical milkweed and replace it with native in areas um, to kind of solve this, solve this issue and hope that it doesn't continue to build up. Great. Thank you, Emma. Um, I'm just going to note quickly that we're a couple of minutes over our end time, so if you have to step off, um, folks are welcome to, but we'll keep going with a we couple will keep more going questions. With a couple questions. Um, Excuse me, this is Michael. Sorry, that one must have been another phone. Um, this is Michael. This is the captioner speaking for Michael. Oh, uh, okay. The question is, is there an ecotourism for monarch preservation? Um, I'll, let, um, I'll let Pablo answer that one. Is there ecotourism for um, the monarch conservation? In fact, there is. And there's a lot of pro programs that are, develop are being developed to have a more sustainable tourism. However, each particular sanctuary, because it's managed by a particular indigenous community, has a different scheme of accepting tourists. And I think that as tourists, we have to be informed that every time that we go to these forests, we have an impact. And there has to be a way to tell everyone, especially local tourists, that there should be no garbage in the area. They should, they should leave it with no signs of their presence. So... Every time that uh, a, a tourist enters the reserve, depending on, on a particular sanctuary, the local tourists, the, sorry, the local guides and the local people that host them should pass the responsibility to all of the tourists for protecting the sanctuaries and trying to even, if they see any garbage, collect it and leave it better than they, than they found it. As if, you were, as if you were a visitor in someone's home, this would be the same. Absolutely. Um, great. Um, so we will go to um, another question for you, Pablo. Um, can you talk about if um, did different overwintering sites fare differently after last year's storm? We're trying to we're trying to find we're trying to find out how the storm affected each particular sanctuary. So we're, we're conducting a survey, uh, especially looking at the uh, density of the trees. And we hope to have that 
uh, ready to be published fairly soon, although it's taking us a little while because we don't want to interfere with, uh, with tourists. And each particular sanctuary is also very different. Think about it as an island. And let's talk about Cerro Pelon, for example. It's a new, it, it, it's a new forest. The trees are not old. And the monarchs have formed two colonies in Cerro Pelon alone this year. They, they might merge into one colony. But what we're seeing now, because of the storm, we're seeing a lot of different behavior from the butterflies. They were very, very active when they arrived to Mexico, and this is unusual. We saw a few of them mating. What's unusual is that they did not form their colonies right around the time when they usually form their colonies, even though they arrived on the 1st of November. If you remember the last season, there was a hurricane that hit Mexico, and that delayed the arrival of the butterflies to their sanctuaries. But this year, the butterflies arrived right on time, and we did not see their similar behavior. And I think that they were still trying to find the appropriate area in the forest to form their colonies. And this was a result of the storm that really affected the sanctuaries and the structure of the forest. There's a lot um, more questions that we have for you both, but um, unfortunately we're going to need to um, wrap it up. Um, we're over our allotted time here, um, but I just want to say a huge thank you to our presenters, to NCTC for hosting, and to all of you for participating. We're really sorry we didn't um, address all of the questions we received today, but please feel free to reach out to us at the MJV. Pablo's contact information is um, listed on the slide there um, and we could also put you in touch with Emma um, so feel free to reach out if you have further questions um, you can also reference our previous webinars um, we have a webinar um, with the folks from Project Monarch Health on OE and we have several other um, really great expert webinars on our website um, and we hope to see you for our next webinar, which is going to be Thursday, February 16th, focusing on seed mix design. Uh, you can find more information and register for those upcoming webinars on the Monarch Joint Venture events page. So I just want to say a huge thank you again to everyone for being here today, and um, goodbye, and we'll see you next time.